Hello and welcome to a, what is it? Oh, a jet propelled episode of the Drywall Podcast. I am your host, Nick Harmon. With us today, I am very excited to announce Alana Nicole Black, owner of Rocket City Drywall out of Huntsville, Alabama. She joins us for a very educational two-part episode, this obviously being part one. We dive into some fun trivia about Alabama and the South and her grandfather and how he started Rocket City Drywall back in the day, but also how he may have inspired Alana to tackle something much bigger than drywall. Yeah. And, you know, we talked about my grandfather and passing away in 2018. The last conversation we had, we had spent two and a half hours talking about updates that um, uh, of the research I was doing on the recycling side. And he was so excited and, you know, he just was so encouraging. And this is something that makes a lot of sense. It's something that we've got to do. And my very last conversation with him, he he was so excited. He followed me out of the house as I was leaving. And he told me, you just got to do it. He said, it's got to be done. Somebody's got to do it. You might as well be the one to do it. Alana has a courageous story and one that requires the backstory of Rocket City Drywall so that we can adequately dig into an exciting new direction as a product manufacturer and the birth of her business child Back to Earth episode 95 will leave you eager to hear the rest of her story in part two. This episode of the Drywall Podcast and all of the episodes of the Drywall Podcast in the end of May and all of June are going to be brought to you by Rocket City Drywall. Not only are they contributing to the success of the Drywall Podcast, but you can listen to owner Alana Black's story on episode 96 and 97. Alana discusses her path to owning this thriving drywall distributor and how that path enabled her to discover a new product. Not many women get to say that they learned to drive behind the wheel of a forklift at eight years old, but that's just one of many skills Alana learned from her grandfather at Rocket City Drywall. She's owned this mom and pop supply yard in Huntsville since 2016 and has dedicated her life to preserving the legacy of her family business. Serving residential and commercial construction, she promotes old school business values while pushing her industry to be ever growing in the innovation and the quality aspects. She reminds us to never underestimate the little giants. This episode of the Drywall Podcast was also brought to you by Fresco Harmony, making walls better since 2004. Fresco Harmony will be hosting a training event at CSR in both their Concord, Toronto, and Barrie locations. If you'd like more information about that, you can reach out to me directly at info at frescoharmony.com. Those events are scheduled for the 6th and 7th. We'll be hanging out at CSR all day on the 6th and 7th. That's a Thursday and a Friday in June. Come check out the training. I'd love to meet you. It would be fantastic. You're going to have fun. All of the other things. But for now, Alana Black, Rocket City Drywall on the 96th episode of the Drywall Podcast. Let's get you into got, it. You uh, got some cinder block there. I'm in my office. So we are in, we've got what you would think of as a, uh, a typical drywall supply house. And uh, so, yeah, we're all concrete block here. We've got um, we've got my my armored man back here and my great grandmother's chair. OK. All right. Nice. <laughs> and what does the armored man represent? Um, well, so I'll be honest with you. My my kid just really liked him. Uh, we saw yeah. him at a antique store 
and um, we named him Sir Francis, and he okay. uh, he he usually sits by the front door and uh, and greets everyone. <laughs> Good. We, we like to keep things uh, light and humorous around here. Good, and Sir Francis will be joining us on this episode of the Drywall Podcast today. <laughs> How yep, exciting! I, I think I, my kids will be proud. He doesn't say much. He's a good man. He's a good man. You know, he just sits there, holds the sword, you know, serves and protects. And then grandma's chair real quick. And this is kind of for the YouTubers. If they want to go onto the YouTube channel and watch the uh, podcast, they can do that and get a chance to see Sir Francis in real life and also grandma's chair. What's the significance of grandma's chair? So, so that's actually my my great grandmother. So Ooh. my my dad's grandmother, and she had all of these you know antique Victorian furniture. Uh, she lived in Springfield, Illinois. And when my grandfather was downsizing, he passed some furniture down that ended up with my brother. And my brother couldn't keep it, so he said, "Don't you have a place in your office for it?" And so, sure enough, I do. <laughs> yeah, we have somebody to sit on it as well. Cool. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I could I could spend the whole hour talking about <laughs> tchotchkes in Alana's office, but we have more important things to get to. Uh, Alana is the owner of Rocket City Drywall in uh, what city? Huntsville, Huntsville, Alabama. Huntsville, Alabama. So we are northern Alabama. We're only about 20 miles from the Tennessee state line, south of the Tennessee state line. Okay, let me ask you this. Do you like the song Sweet Home Alabama? You know, who doesn't? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's fine. It certainly uh, it certainly has its place. <laughs> you big you big Skinner fan, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's Free Bird and, and, and Sweet yeah. Home Alabama, right? That's yeah, what everybody... Course. Yeah. There's another there's another uh Alabama reference song. Well, I'm, there's many, but uh The Grateful Dead comes to mind. Alabama Get Away. I like that one too. Well, so a lot of people don't realize that Muscle Shoals, Alabama, which is uh yes. just uh, west of us. So yeah, we we had a huge music scene there. We actually oh, my yeah. Ford, um one of the uh, historic studios there. And it's where um, the Rolling Stones, they recorded yep. Wild Horses. And, shelter. Give me shelter. Yep, give me shelter. Um, actually, the uh, beginning of Freebird, um, Leonard Skinner, they said it was actually like a, uh, gr not a groupie, but like, um, you know, one of their stage handlers or, or people that were part of the group that wrote that little intro in the very beginning. They were kind of stuck while they were rec recording it. And... <laughs> Yeah, iconic. Yeah, yeah. So. Muscle Shoals is iconic. So if I ever get over to uh, Rocket City, or when I get over to Rocket City Drywall, rather, uh, mm -hmm. I definitely want to go see Muscle Shoals. Can can the public go see that recording studio? Yeah, absolutely. They've got they do tours. You definitely want to oh, do the tour. Uh, yeah. They still record Lana Del Rey. He was here recently, and she recorded. Um, Alabama, you know, we, we always say that Huntsville, Muscle Shoals, we get a bad rep because of our last name. Alabama is not typically the most reputable state in the country. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about us, but sure. the reality is, is that we are, um, very hospitable, <laughs> um, probably one of your most, your most down home regions that you can yeah. still get, that you can still come to. Lana Del Rey, she loved that she could go to the mall in Florence and Muscle Shoals. And uh, she said that there was a really great Dillard's there. Uh, but she loved that you can walk down the streets and people aren't going to swarm you. They're not going to, people mind their own business here for the most part. Right. H hence the term uh, Southern hospitality. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. And Huntsville, we're we're a, a not so secret anymore. We went from the fourth largest city to the largest city in the state just in the last three and a half years. Okay. Uh, we have had rapid growth year over year, exponential growth, and a lot of that is attributed to what we are more known for is we have a NASA Space Center, Marshall Space Flight Center here. Okay. We build all of the rocket engines here in Huntsville. 
We also have the Redstone Arsenal, which houses the entirety of the Missile Defense Agency. We have an FBI headquarters here. Okay. Um, we also have the second largest research park in the United States, right behind RTP, fourth largest in the world. So we do a lot in bioengineering. We also do a lot in advanced manufacturing. So we have Mazda Toyota's first uh, joint venture here in Huntsville that brought about 5,000 jobs with it in the last couple Fabulous. of years. It's just, uh, it's really an incredible space. And, and on top of that, we are an hour and a half south of Nashville, three and a half hours from Atlanta. We're really centrally located. Yeah, yeah. Nashville is definitely another place on the bucket list for me. Very cool. A lot of good information. Are you originally from Alabama? So my my grandparents that started Rocket City Drywall were from Alabama. I actually was raised through high school in uh, North Carolina, just outside of Raleigh, North Carolina, a little town okay. called Benson. Uh, I was raised single mom. And so anytime that I wasn't in school, typically my grandfather was, uh, the day I got out of school, my grandfather was at my house waiting to grab me and bring me to Alabama. <laughs> and so I I grew up split between North Carolina and Alabama and okay. re- grew up here right, right by his side in the company. So let's go back. Rocket City. When was Rocket City Drywall founded? And Market. and also Rocket City Drywall is not a drywall company per se that goes and puts drywall on the wall and finishes drywall for all you listeners out there. Rocket City Drywall is a dr- drywall supply company. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the inception of Rocket City Drywall briefly and then uh, what you guys do Yeah, so my grandfather, Charlie Stanley, he was born and raised here in Alabama and grew up in a farming family, farming community, and dropped out of high school. He didn't have the grades to be able to continue playing football, and so he decided if he couldn't play football, why would he go to school? So dropped out around 16 years old. His family gave him the option to work on the farm or go out and find a job, so he went out and found a job. Ended up settling with a company called Moore Hanley. Uh, it's a kind of a bigger regional uh, building material supply company that was here, especially in the southeast. So anybody that's in Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina, Alabama, they are familiar with that old Moore Hanley. And they were a general building supply company. And he worked his way up through from ground level up through management, managed several, uh, became a regional manager. And he built Rocket City Drywall really out of, he saw a need for a specialized drywall supplier. So he saw that with more handling, they were terrible at supplying drywall. So drywall is brittle, it's heavy, it really needs special equipment, special handling, and it was a nuisance and it's not very profitable. Maybe (laughs) Maybe it needs more of a female touch. Maybe it needs more of a, it definitely needed a lighter (laughs) touch. (laughs) So that, that's how he actually got started was he, he had the idea that there was a niche supply uh, capability there. And so he negotiated with Moore Hanley to be able to, after hours, start handling their drywall supply contracts. So he ended up getting a little flatbed truck. And he delivered, my grandmother would go out with them. She'd tell stories about uh, shining her headlights out on, you know, on these projects after dark so that he could go out and he would stock these, these buildings with drywall and ended up building that into Rocket City Drywall. He incorporated, he started it officially 1985, March of 1985, same year I was born. And he incorporated in 1986 and started out really specializing in drywall, just a little flatbed truck that eventually for the old, for the old timers, they remember the scissor bed trucks. You still see some of those every once in a while. Yeah. Um, Certainly, certainly light years away from what we have now in the technology with our boom trucks. And then I'm, 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 Putting together a connection here, Rocket City, is that a terminology used for Huntsville, hence the the NASA program, so hence Rocket City Drywall. Okay. 
Yep, that's us. Yep. All right. So, so Huntsville is is known as the Rocket City. So that's how we that's how we ended up here. A lot of people end up thinking that it had something to do with like sheetrock or that that ah. type of correlation, but no, it's it's where the Rocket City. And he started out, he was primarily a residential supplier. He grew into various products over the years. He branched out into windows and doors. He had a, a big uh, supply working with Keller windows. Um, and he ended up breaking into roofing. We did roofing uh, for decades. And over the years, he, he branched out. So he had multiple locations, um, ended up bringing that back down to one location here in Huntsville. So we've, we've gone through all of the ups and the downs in this industry. For sure. Um, shout out to Charlie. What an entrepreneur. Yeah, my, my pop Charlie. He really was an entrepreneur. You know, he was a curious guy. He, he passed away yeah. in 2018. And he was a curious guy. If he uh, if he wanted to learn something, he'd find a book and he'd learn about it. Or he'd find people that were in it and he'd ask about it. And he always had the mindset that he could really kind of take on anything. That there was yeah. nothing out of reach. You would have to have that mentality, that mindset to do that. Anything in the entrepreneurial realm. When did you take over? I'm going to skip forward a little bit. When did you take over Rocket City? What year? And I took over management 2010, bought it in 2016. So I bought 20, it. Okay. So the, what I'm getting at is that was Charlie ultra proud of you for taking over the company? You know, I, I, I like to think so. I, I hope so. So that was the whole purpose of initially I came into the company because there was a recession and I I knew I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, but I knew I didn't want to be in debt. And so it made sense to come work for a few years, save up. And I thought that I would end up going to graduate school. And then we ended up having the the pinnacle of our recession in 2010. And that's when I took over management. And I, I think that he was proud. I think that we worked really hard together to, yeah. to pull our company through. We lost over half of the independent suppliers from 2008 to 2012. Uh, we really, some of them simply went out, went under. Some of them went under, closed down because they didn't have secession plans in place. And then a lot of them were consolidated into your big box stores, your, your alphabets, your ABCs, GMS, FBMs, those companies. Okay, so there's much like Albuquerque, there's a lot of these companies getting beat up, uh, bought up and beat up by the big dogs uh, out there. Well, that's interesting to me that you would have be inspired to take over the company when it's on a downward trend. Tell me about that. What what inspired you there? Well, so I had. Um... I had worked in the company from 2007 until 2010 under my mother's management. My mother and my stepfather managed the company for from 2005 to 2010. And, okay. um, you know, my mother came into it when the industry was just piping hot. Like you, you didn't have to try very hard. The drywall sold itself. And okay. so she came into it in really a boom period. And then when the recession hit, it was just like overnight that that faucet shut off. And and so in 2010, she left the company very suddenly. And, um, you know, her my she she's one of the smartest women I've, I've ever met in my life. Uh, she's a good woman. Um, but her and my grandfather were like oil and water. They, okay. they they simply had a difficult time working together. So when you have a difficult time working together and you're working through a crisis, it really was a challenge. And so yeah. they ended up leaving the company and everything during that period had been switched over to computers. So up until 2005, my grandparents still ran everything on paper books. Mm -hmm. He was still doing estimates on a piece of scrap lumber that he found yeah. on the job. Like it was, it was, <laughs> we were still that company. Yeah. And so 2010, he asked me to step up and really help him come back into the company and understand how things had changed, understand how the computer systems worked, understood, um, you know, 
where we could make our adjustments to really save our business. And so together, he and I went, we cut our business in half. That's how we survived the recession. So a lot of, a lot of people think that, you know, if you downsize, then that's the end of your company. That's not true. We were, we were doing X amount of business in 2010 and we were hemorrhaging money. Yeah. In we did half of that business and we were breaking even it um you know it was a a three-year recovery for us learned a lot of hard lessons during that time 2010 okay but you didn't take over until 2016 so you were really i was was cutting your teeth i was cutting my teeth yeah so i took over management in 2010 so it was under my operating control and from he left out of the company again, went back home in 2011. So really 2011, it was it was me here um, running the show. And at the time, you know, the company was the sole source of income for six members of my immediate family. It was my it was mine and my husband at the time. Yeah. It was my brother and his wife. It was my mom, even though she wasn't working in the company husband. It was my grandfather and and my grandmother. I mean, it was, we were all heavily invested in this company. Failing was not an option. It was was something that we needed to be able to figure out how to make this work. What were you doing in that three years to bolster sales? What strategies were you implementing that shifted the company, do you feel? So I feel like Prior to me coming in, we had gone through a period where we were trying to compete with the big box stores, with your your ABC stores. And at the time also, we had gone heavily into roofing sales. And roofing was just such a volatile industry. It had really, really low margins, a significant risk, a lot of fly-by-night roofers, so a lot of financial risk involved with it. So the biggest thing that we did is that we started firing customers. So when you have customers that are your larger, some of the national home builders Mm -hmm. that have your your highest maintenance accounts that (laughs) require the most service at the cheapest price, (laughs) it it, it simply, the the math didn't work. And so we were killing ourselves and making less and less money every single year. And so on the other side of it, though, there was a whole segment of our community here that believed in us, that believed in a fair market, that believed in fair pricing, that believed in fair service, and that still had a relationship base. And so we went back to our roots of what got us through the first 20 plus years of our of our business. And we went to those customers that we could build relationships with, that we could service the heck out of, that we could offer fair pricing to, not the cheapest. You know, first thing I tell anybody is that my drywall is exactly the same as anybody else's. It's a commodity. Uh, only difference is, is that mine's more expensive than everybody else. I've got all the other major players here and they're all cheaper than me. <laughs> so that right. if, if pricing is your is your main focus, then I, I'm just not your your company. And that's OK. That's OK to not uh, to not have all the business in the world. I don't need all the business in the world. Smart. I need that value us and that we value and that Smart. cuts down your risk it increases your your profitability and your and your value add right uh d- it makes me think of the 80 20 rule have you heard of that I-, I have so you go through this change in uh i guess in clientele you you're sort of weeding out and you were doing this personally and you noticed a shift, uh, and I guess when the shift started occurring, how did it come to be that, you know, did did you get the tap? Uh, did all the family members get together in a board meeting? You had a round table. Sir Francis was there, and you guys decided we need to have Alana in charge. How did that come to be? Well, I, I think it was the relationship that I had with my grandfather – initially okay I, I, there was just so much trust there and um collaboration and my grandfather and i would spend hours solving all the problems of the world and so i think that it was a natural order to 
be able to step in and and be that support for him. We just we we had that relationship. And um when I bought the company in 2016, um, at that point, my brother had already moved on. He ended up going back into the private sector as an air traffic controller, uh, which he had done in his previous career with the Air Force. Okay. And so he he left the company. Uh, my stepfather was still in the company and still is in the company. Um, but he and my mother did not want any part of that ownership. And my grandparents were getting older and all of their wealth was tied into the business and um, they could not comfortably retire. And so at that point, it made a lot of sense for me to be able to um, buy in our secession plan was for me to buy the company, assume its debts, assume its assets um, and provide that capital, that cash to my, my grandparents so that then they could retire comfortably. Sadly, and it sounds like Charlie only had a couple of years of retirement. <laughs> he, he only had a couple of years She's left. Sick. You know, he, uh, but it sounds he was, like he, he loved what he did. I mean, you know, when you, you know, he was a go-getter. He, he loved what he did. He stayed yeah. busy and active. He was, yeah. at, um, okay. 26, 2018 is when he passed away. So he was 76 when he passed away and he was roller skating with my daughter the month that he passed away. (laughs) Yeah. He, uh, he was still incredibly active and, uh, yeah, it was, it was sudden. We, we didn't expect it. It just hit out of the blue and, uh, was a tremendous loss for our whole family. Okay. Alana takes over the business. What's your first course of action? Yeah. 2000. (laughs) 16 when I when I bought the company yeah so uh eight we're pushing eight eight, eight years was yeah March. sorry yeah eight um and yeah no so 2000 and I I started I started my course of the direction I wanted to see our company go but really before I even bought the company so I knew that I wanted to take us into diversifying our business structure so we couldn't only be residential. So the, the what I saw and learned during the recession is that typically you need a type of blend so that one is when one's up, if the other one's down, you've still got something there to make up. So you have more opportunity by expanding into other market spaces. So yeah. all the way back in 2011, I hired a salesman that had commercial experience to help me learn about the products, help me learn about the contractors, help me learn about uh, the the manufacturers, start building those relationships. Yeah. And I I spent five years developing that market before I bid my my first um, commercial project. Started bidding my first commercial project. Yeah. I was ready for it in 2016, and that was when China um, all of the mass inflation with China, so the tariffs hit, and so everybody was in an absolute panic because all of a sudden pricing was just completely inflated. There was no pricing security. And so I actually took 2016 and watched. I watched how the manufacturers responded. I watched how the contractors responded. I watched how they were supported or not supported. I I watched who ultimately held the financial burden of some of the, the poor business practices that were going through. And then I took those lessons and began bidding commercial work in 2017. So that's yeah. that's the first big thing that I that I did as the business owner was starting to branch out onto the commercial side of it. I also worked really hard in developing my relationships and network in our community, which also started earlier. That started in, in 2010 when I'm trying to figure out how in the hell do we save our business? And so the only way I knew to do that was to go to people that were smarter than me, that were um, willing to mentor and advocate and support and uplift. And so uh, I got, became active in our chamber of commerce and uh, yeah. And so our chamber of commerce here is really who brings all of our major industry. They're a tremendous partner here in our community. Are you involved with the Home Builders Associations there? Involved with the Home Builders Associations. I was on the Associate Council, the Board of Directors, the Executive Board. Um, 
I, I spent a lot of a lot of years at the Home Builders Association. And I I see you as being like spearheading like the social media and all that. Like are you you yeah. do the all that personally? Well, no. So I, once upon a time I did. Um yeah. I I really stepped away from it when my kids were were getting older, so pushing teenage years. I didn't want them seeing me on my phone developing marketing and and on these social networks all the time. And yeah. so I kind of passed that torch. Actually, my brother-in-law that's in the company now, he handles our, our social media. So you'll see Stuart okay. post quite a bit of it. But no, I, I think we've talked about this, that I remember you meeting you very early on. I mean, we're talking 2014, maybe 2015. Yeah. And that, or the early days of like the coalition of, dry, of framers and drywall contractors and uh -huh. I think drywall junkies was around. It was a little, it was, it, you know, it had its ups and downs, <laughs> but people yeah. were just starting to realize that there's access, like social media could provide access to people all over the world that are in your same industry and craft and trade and uh -huh. interests. And yeah, so I remember seeing you, I remember seeing, <laughs> Jose De Leon with Paul Finger, he did a great job. Joel Jansen with Tremtex. And, uh -huh. uh, yeah, no, it was Drywall. Uh, uh, Drywall Nation was there. And Drywall like Nation, Ice Rock, and yeah, <laughs> you know, like uh, I think Drywallers worldwide, but some of those Facebook groups got enormous right away. Um, yeah. I read a book. I was referred a book called "Crush It" by Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, back. 10, 11 years ago. And it was all like social media, social media, like all the platforms, get a YouTube page, start making videos, start making content. And that's kind of just what I did. And I mean, early on, that's how I started sort of hooking up with people, but I was still having a hard time. Like people are like color joint compound. What's that dude? You know, I was getting a lot of pushback still like, you know, Oh, uh, I thought it, it was, was hard. I thought it was genius from the very beginning. <laughs> and I really so so my passion in this industry is elevating our craft, right? So introducing the uh, the most innovative products, the highest quality products, and making things to where we are performing better. So the monotony, just like if I were having to sell a commodity all day, every day at the cheapest price, I would take Sir Francis's sword and I would have to stab it in my chest. I would, that's no life to live, right? So you've got to have higher purpose than just doing the dull day in, day out. And well, so that's you, what I really call Espresso Harmony was that you were bringing artistry, you were being craftsmanship back. You were thank being- you tremendous advocate for our craftsmen, which were really, truly, especially 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, being, just being beaten down, being beaten down as we're just this, you know, blue collar, drug rattled, you know, useless class. And that's not what we are. <laughs> no, no. Um, it makes me think of, and I, you know, I hesitate to bring up a competitor, but CSR has been a very big uh, supporter of mine. Their model of having a large range of dynamic tools, a clean showroom, like very, uh, I mean, their, I, their facility is amazing. That's what that reminds me of. Now, are you going like with the tools and this sort of thing? Are you guys selling tools? Are you selling unique tools? Are you taking the uh, also L and W like no shame, but we have an L and W here that took over a a, a company uh, here in town, but they took it. It was like a, a a crap hole, and they completely remodeled red, white, and blue. Of course, they have a lot of money to go behind it. They're a giant, but they made the facility look beautiful. Big screen TV, lot of showroom, uh, you know, and I think that speaks volume. So was Rocket City taking a page out of that book? Are you guys are you guys selling unique tools? How did you differentiate yourself and create that uh, element of innovation in this really challenging space? Yeah, no, we are. Um... We are we are not the five star dining. We are your mom and pop diner. So okay. we are where you go on Saturday morning with your family because it's comfy okay. and it's familiar and it's it. Okay. 
Um, there is, I, I love the the marketing and the branding of having a really beautiful showroom. And, and there is a, something to that experience. It's phenomenal. It's um, pricey. If it's pricey, I, I don't have the money for it. Yeah, you know. I just got the carpet out of my office from the 1970s, so <laughs> I've still got. I got one by one asbestos tiles in my ceiling. Uh -huh. Like I'm, I'm, I'm humble. My roots yeah. are humble. Yep. So I have the the five hundred thousand dollar six story brand new crane that we got last year that beautiful. has all the bells and the whistles and it's beautiful and I've got the the new baby boom that has it's got its own Insta Instagram page you should follow it Adventures of Baby totally. Boom totally Adventures um, it's, a, it's a not yeah Adventures of Baby Boom it's a uh, it's actually a non CDL crane that or non CDL optional crane so under a certain amount of weight you do not have to have of a CDL to be able to operate this this uh, uh, piece of equipment. So that actually has been phenomenal. Well, we run that every single day. Why would you create a separate Instagram page for the baby boom? Because it's so cute. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, there, so there's actually a, a social media page called Boom Truck Madness, and ah. it's, it's, same, it's done the same thing for boom truck operators okay. and our delivery drivers that, and even just our stalkers. It's created community, and again, advocacy okay. for the trade, and just like it did with our craftsmen, our our contractors. Um, and so, yeah, no, there's people that are interested in that stuff and, yeah. and people like following it. They like to see what it's doing in Huntsville and they like to see the cool. maneuverability. Paul Finger that created the truck, they love to see it because they like to see their, their equipment actually in action. So it's dual branding there. And, yeah. um, it's is just, it like, how do you, fun, right? <laughs> yeah. How do you tie in Rocket City to Baby Boom or is that just a, um, a do people just glean that rocket city runs this page how do you tie those two together yeah, and well, do you so our, our, do you yeah, have so other our, offshoots uh pages yeah so rocket city drywall first of all is on all of our all of our trucks and our branding so you okay. immediately see rocket city drywall over and over again smart uh, and and that's not a and that's not our most active page. It's not you know there are plenty of people that have their dogs with their own Instagrams that get a lot more views than what mine what my that's little what, page. That's does. what I was just thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it is it is that same concept is is yeah. you know having that little that little offshoot. No, Rocket City Drywall is probably our most on Facebook is probably our most active page. Um, and then, uh, which we're going to get into later, but the back to earth gypsum, the recycling side of it, that's really yeah. what we're, we're developing as well. LinkedIn is another area that I, I have had a lot of um, success in navigating and, and building out our network. You know, I, I've used LinkedIn. I've, I've been able to have direct conversations with, you know, the global CEO of Senkaban, uh, just just because of LinkedIn, just because yeah. there's that accessibility there. And uh, that being able to have people in your network that have such influence and passion and drive, that is, I think, the, the best thing that anybody can possibly do. Yeah, uh, underutilized platform as well, myself included. Like, I know that there's tremendous potential on LinkedIn. I just have an affinity for Instagram and the uh, client to client or a business to client relationships that I develop there. I'm just good, better at it, I guess. Then LinkedIn has a different set of principles and strategy to posting than Instagram versus Facebook. They're all a little bit different versus YouTube. They're all a little different. And I think how we approach those social platforms is important. I'm really nerdy. It's so uh, I really like to know what's going on in the business world in general. Um, I like to know what's going on with the economy I like to know what's going on um, internationally and yeah. all of that in a very serious, I, I'm, I'm not yeah. nearly as much fun as the rest of my family or my husband. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, I, I take it, I take it deep and heavy and dark way too yeah. fast, but yeah. I mean, but, but I love learning about the, the, the kind of more serious professional things that are going out there in the world and yeah. people are sharing and there's a wealth of knowledge out there. And I, I like to, I like to be, uh, I, I guess, engaged with that.
Well, you have a great personality, though. I think you could probably be more prevalent on Instagram. But I get that. And that serious too, that seriousness and attention to detail translates to a successful business for Rocket City Drywall. I mean, I can tell you're very astute. Going back to the, the separation, are you guys are carrying full lines of tools, uh, brands. You got the newest tools coming out. You got your thumb on the pole. Are you selling all these different brands? So we are heavily trimmed, or not trim tech, sorry, tape tech and drywall okay. mask are, okay. are the two that, that we carry the most of. Um, we what? like, dry, we like drywall master a lot. So yeah. uh, Janelle, the owner is it, very engaged with his business and stands behind his product and you okay. can catch him on the phone that same day. Uh, we do a lot of tool repairs here, actually. Okay. So that's that's one of our service ads. Is okay. That Mark, my my stepfather, that works here in the, in the company, he's on the um, shop side of it, so he does all of our tool repairs. He actually came out of the jewelry business, and so he his background yeah. was doing jewelry design and reading schematics, and then building these these little teeny tiny pieces. Totally. And so that translated well on reading schematics yeah. of your your drywall tools. And so yeah. we keep every little 50 cent screw spring washer. We've, we've got every single little piece here. He and probably so, loves doing that from jewelry to it. drywall tools. They drywall tools just kind of look fun. Like if I was a machinist, like it'd be fun to tinker around with that stuff, you know, and, and dial it in and get it like working smoothly. You know, it's fun for us and, and probably gives the most satisfaction is that, um, I, I think we might have briefly touched on this before. So we are dominantly a, a non-union area. And so okay. most of our subcontractors are uh, little independent guys that work under, we've got just a handful of your, your larger subs that hire out little independents. And so not a lot of money sitting in these, not a lot of tools floating around. And so when somebody's tool breaks down on their job site that day, that means they can't finish their job if their right. tool does not get repaired. That means that they're not getting money. And so these people live paycheck to paycheck, just like we do. And so being able to provide that instant um, support and what could otherwise be really yeah. kind of catastrophic in some ways, you know, you don't think about what it's like to lose a, a thousand dollar tool, but when that thousand dollar tool is the difference between you getting paid today or not, <laughs> that is a, that's a probably what gives us the most reward with it. Why tape tech and drywall master? Uh, what is, uh, what do you like about those two companies? I leave that in the hands of Mark that does our purchasing because okay. he, he's my, he's my tool nerd. And so he is the one that's doing all the research behind it. And he likes working on those tools. I think that he finds the design um, to be the, especially the most universal to work with. Um, okay. And I, I think that it really, and it also it goes with what's dominant in our market space right now. So Tape Tech was, was dominant in our market mm -hmm. space already. And so mm -hmm. being able to support that for all of these years, but in, we introduced Drywall Master and people like it. They like that it is a um, affordable alternative, but a, a high quality tool. Okay, so drywall master might be in alignment with like the maybe your level five, and then tape tape tech is like your more your higher end. Correct. Yep. Okay. All right. Very cool. So Can Am, I've, I've talked to Can Am. I would love to to introduce their tools. Um, we've got a we I, I met Wolfgang um at yeah. AWCI recently. And, uh, you know, we are definitely always exploring on what else we can offer. Yeah, the semi, I mean, the semi-automatic realm, that, that transitionary period between automatic taping tools and semi-automatic taping tools, I, I feel like Can-Am fits a good niche for the applicator that's maybe moving from the banjo and hand finishing to the, the automatic world. Like Can Am is in that sweet spot. And they're kind of the only company I feel like that specializes in that realm and and wolfgang Mid being intermediate the per yeah he's dialed it like he's really dialed that in uh you know 
Yeah, that's a good point. And we do, we have, because we have so many people that are just being introduced into the trade, especially on just, you know, your lower tier installation side of it, that we've got a lot of people using banjos um, and that are not as familiar working with your automatic tools. So that intermediate actually is is a good point. I'm going to say um, on products. So we are heavily um, engaged with National Gypsum Company. Okay. So we, out of six suppliers here in our market space, five of them carry Merco finishing um, mud. Okay. <laughs> and that that's most likely because we've got a Merco plant not too far from us in Tennessee. Okay. But, and, and, and even we, for a time, carried Merco mud. And that's one of the things that I changed when I took over is I said, you know, with six suppliers selling Merco, all we're doing is we're trying to undercut each other on really a lower tier quality product. And so... That's when we introduced Proform back into the market and really helped to build out that space. Proform, Proform Light and Advantage um, are, are probably the two that we sell the most of. Okay. Carton, we don't do a lot of buckets here in the space. We don't have, we have really mild winters. So uh, mostly in, in just cartons. And what does that country, mean? You equate buckets to temperature. So I, I, I typically see, so you typically see buckets in the north is is my understanding and i might have that wrong but that's that's my understanding is that typically you see it in the north because you I, it has something to do with the freezing or the the temperature stabilization of it but then also on and you you would know this yeah i with, don't <laughs> this is the first i'm hearing this okay i thought it was like west well, coast, that check east me, coast. But that's my understanding because and this is this is somewhat anecdotal because i've always asked why we don't have of as many buckets here in our market space and and that's that's what i've been told is that okay. you know it's more expensive um it is more shelf stable so unless you are needing a longer shelf life of it then and and if you don't have a, a heated warehouse like we don't have a, a heated warehouse and okay so, um, it's not temperature control, but we have mild winters. And so it really is, is not a challenge for us, but that, that's what, that's what I've been told anecdotally. I thought um, it was cost and efficiency, like, because your buckets cost more money. It's more, not only more efficient to manufacture the cartons, but, uh, or boxes as we call them, but like, uh, you know, a bunch of extra buckets laying around. It's like less you can recycle the cardboard. I mean, I don't know. But there's I... a massive, but there's a massive bucket industry. There, there really is. There's, there's quite a significant segment that is totally buckets. And so, um, commercial. I think on the commercial side, they they like it more. It's easier to palletize. It's easier to yeah. carry around. Um, yeah. it, I guess that convenience side of it. But what I've been told is that it was on the more of the weather conditioning. So okay. uh, that was the biggest factor on whether or not you saw that as much. Or so so and with cost being right there with it. So if you are in a temperate, you know, moderately temperature environment, you don't need to pay for buckets. You can use cartons, okay. right? That's, interesting that's interesting well you know we're not adverse to learning something new <laughs> <laughs> temperature that's that's really cool so we got gyps national gypsum pro form and uh and what else is that it uh it, no so pro form so we're we're heavy blue boxes so a lot of blue boxes a lot of advantage which is kind of your mid-grade um it, it more comparable um quality to like a Merco, like a Merco 500. Okay. And then we, we do a lot of all purpose as well, just your black boxes. Okay. And we, we've done well, we've really had a great partnership with them. Um, I mean, our relationship with National Gypsum goes all the way back to the eighties. And so we started out with Republic, which it ultimately ended up being what's now American Gypsum. Um, uh. And then we developed relationships with National Gypsum. And then we were big with Temple for a long time, which is now Certainty. Got bought by Certainty many okay. years ago. Uh, we still do a lot of business with Certainty. I, I love Saint Gabon. I think that they're a tremendous company. I love everything they're doing in the world. I, I really admire them. They're they're one of the top ten oldest companies in the world. I, I love their story. 
Uh, we also do business with Georgia Pacific. There's a plant right here in Tennessee at Cumberland City. Uh, we do a little bit of business with uh, USG. There's a that there our closest plant is here in Bridgeport, Alabama. We've had a, a challenge getting accessibility to USG. Uh, you know, USG owned L and W for monsters. Every monsters and then warren buffett came out as an investor and said i'm dumping all my stocks this is the dumbest industry i've ever seen in my life nobody right. wants to make money <laughs> <laughs> nobody nobody accused warren buffett of being stupid <laughs> <laughs> so usg sold off l and w and then l and w was bought by um abc and so okay back in roofing and siding that was and recent yeah that last probably five years that they were bought in, in by ABC. Yeah. The, the pandemic messes with my timeline, but totally. yeah, it, was, it was fairly recent. So with L&W being here in our market space, USG didn't really do a whole lot of favors for us. And, and then we're actually, in 2015, another thing I did for our business, we joined a um, buying cooperative that, or like a, like a buying group called Affiliated Distributors. And that is a group of independent suppliers, just like myself across the country that gather together. And with our group or our organization, it gives us more leverage against the larger suppliers. And so our collective nice. buying as an organization is comparable to a GMS. Oh, and so then that helps interesting. on pricing, on rebate structures and all of that. Now we're, we're not anywhere close to what the big boxes are able to negotiate. Um, Home Depot's right. killing markets right now, yeah. now that they've decided that they want to be distributors, which is always, oh, they try it every 10 years. There's what does that mean? What does that mean? So Home Depot, they sell products. I can go in there. I can get I can get a discount on 12 boxes. It's kind of efficient. What does that mean, a uh, distributor versus just a retailer to you as it pertains to Home Depot? Right. So as a retailer, Home Depot has always done silly things, right? So um, they they have the volume to be able to play with pricing and markets, and they have the product selection to be able to be very aggressive on certain product segments. So okay. you make your money on your lumber, you lose money on your drywall. So for instance, uh, if you sell it as a package. Now, yeah. as a as a retailer, typically you would see a Home Depot or a Lowe's, they'd carry maybe a couple of lifts of drywall, you know, hundred sheets at the most that they've got there. And it was to your, it was really for your home remodeler, your, mm -hmm. you know, your individual that was coming in buying a couple of sheets and then they'd go home yeah and plenty so of times i go to home depot and the the mud's not there because somebody came and bought it all out and i gotta wait an, an hour for the lift guy to come pull one down or they're out so there is mm -hmm. that factor as well sometimes they just don't have it so home depot several years ago decided you know what we're going to get in when this is really a post-pandemic development in that they saw the need for better supply chains and so better fluency in their supply chain they really had difficulty getting materials and so they set up these massive distribution warehouses and focused in on products like drywall that has uh, had a smaller right. segment in and they negotiated these massive deals with manufacturers and um, had really aggressive pricing at a really okay. aggressive volume um, and filled up these distribution warehouses. And I was recently at this conference with affiliated distributors and, and talking to other independent contractor or independent suppliers across the United States. A hundred percent of us can go to Home Depot right now and buy drywall for less than we can buy directly from the manufacturers. So it's, it's, it's it is, um, it's, it is, it's cheaper here. It's cheaper here. And I got to break the balls cheaper. at the guys because L and W sells Fresco Harmony here in Albuquerque. So I go there and get my mud. It's like, thanks. You know, it's a head nod. Plus I don't, you know, I'd rather support them than support Home Depot. Uh, but yeah, it's cheaper at Home Depot. 
It's cheaper. It is. And even and, and I'll buy a pallet. I'll buy a pallet, you know, yeah. and like just sit on it and use boxes as I need them. And I, you know, I've lost, we, we do a lot of multifamily. We do very well with multifamily and we, it's kind of our specialty. And we lost a multifamily, one of my favorite contractors, they're like family to me, but the nice. pricing was so different at Home Depot that he couldn't walk away from it. And I told him, I don't blame you. Um, but yeah. he's also having to arrange his own equipment to go pick up the material. He's having to arrange his own labor to stock a multifamily. And so yeah. look, I, I've got a $500,000 truck. I've got two forty dollars yeah. an hour plus, you know, the installers that are or not installers, but suppliers, delivery guys yep. that are experts on stocking this. So if it's if it's worth your time and your yeah. effort, save the money there. Yeah. Um, You're not gonna get the love with Home Depot. Sorry, man. Hit the skids. Yeah, no, they're not. <laughs> they they are they can open up bulk distribution warehouses, but they're never going to get into the supply game. You know, they they sub out yeah. all of their all of their supply. And so uh, we are a for profit organization that sells building materials at fair market price. And we have the equipment and the labor to be able to do that in a market competitive way. They're not putting me out of business, but I'm not going to support their business and that all they're doing is a race to the bottom, sell as much as they can for as cheap as they can, as fast as they can. And that's not how you stay in business long term. You just you can't do that forever. I mean, Home Depot has a different model than what you have. And I, I what you said about sometimes we have to take a step back and I mean, even around patching. I mean, I don't care what the zeros look like. Like I go to do a patch. It's like. You know, I charge a hundred bucks an hour. Okay. You know, for Fresco Harmony patch, it's going to be 300 bucks. You know, it's like they gasp, you know, and nobody has a problem paying a painter 500 bucks come in and blow out a lid. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, maybe the patch doesn't look the way they want it to look. It's like, I'm not going back to free for free to do your, you know, it's a Fresco Harmony patch. Maybe the color doesn't match. I can reskim the area. I can spend however, just like a plumber, I can spend however much time you want. I have to charge. I can't give that away. And I think that mentality from the applicator to the drywall supply yard throughout this industry is, is um, consistent. Like we consistently look, get looked down on. It's no wonder Warren Buffett didn't want anything to do it. He took one look at this industry and he was like, Forget about it. this. Ain't Silicon Valley like these people haven't changed in sixty years? They ain't gonna change now. Well, I know contractors are feeling pricing pressure right now, especially especially now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're starting to see slowdowns all the way across the country. Um, they're feeling the need to be more aggressive on their bidding. All of the projects last year went over budget, whether it was because of pricing materials or whether it was because of labor. I mean, there was just the contractors are under a significant strain right now. And so I don't want anybody to miss here that I'm saying that suppliers or manufacturers or installers should just be going out and getting everything they possibly can. That's that's not what this game is about. Um the reality on our dry, on drywall specifically is that and why we saw so many significant increases over the last, well, really starting in 2020. So over the last four years is we had an artificial repression in material pricing from 2015 until 2020. So say, th what say that again. So it's an artificial repression in market pricing. And what I mean by that is that the drywall manufacturers were recovering their pricing after the recession. So in our market, whereas drywall was selling for $20 a board in 2005 for a half piece of four by 12, now all of a sudden it's selling under, we got under $6 a board for a piece of half four by 12. And so um, our labor costs didn't decline, our operation costs didn't decline, but now all of a sudden we're making a quarter of what we were of what we were selling for before. Okay. And so 
year over year from 2010 until 2014, we saw small steady incremental increases from manufacturers. So manufacturers would announce January, we're going to have a 10% increase or, you know, whatever they, 5% increase. Then they got hit with a price fixation lawsuit. So the problem was, was that we've had so much consolidation in manufacturing. and we've only got five manufacturers in the United States and they all announced their increases on the same day and the same amount. So they got hit with a massive price fixation lawsuit. I mean, they had to give out so much money and that was in 2014. So what we saw in 2015 was that all of a sudden manufacturers were scared. So they just took a huge hit on their on on their capital and they didn't want to continue with that risk. So we saw in 2015 they put out price increase announcements but they were staggered. USG is going to go up January 1st but National is not going to go up until February 15th. <laughs> And so what happens is that everybody just stops buying from USG and starts buying from National Gypsum. And then what happens, USG says, oh, aye, no, aye, I aye. can't lose all my business. And so they drop off their increase. And so they and then the increase ends up dissipating and the market doesn't accept the increase. And so it was a lot of pushback, especially from distributors. So your your large box stores, a lot of pushback from them of you don't go up on my price. I'll just buy from the other manufacturer. Yeah, <laughs> so I love this feedback too, because it's you get a lot of, uh, this podcast is predominantly applicators, man. I love having applicators on, you know, hearing about their journey. Why did you become a drywall finisher? Why did you become a hanger? It's good to get this side of the conversation so that we can illuminate the reason behind there's actual reasons behind some of this price fluctuation in a commodity yeah. product this is like it's you're not selling something unique or neat drywall is very boring i mean for lack of a better word it's very commoditized you got mud you got drywall five manufacturers in the united states that's ridiculous you know mm -hmm. there's a large amount of space here for five manufacturers so. Mm -hmm. um so yeah. hence the regulation like yeah. the regulatory well, laws and nobody complained when we didn't see material prices increase from 2015 to 2020. Nobody complained when there was this, all of a sudden we were reaching pre-recession volume. So we're back as busy as we ever were, but the pricings only recovered, you know, a little over two thirds, right at two thirds. And okay. so we're as busy as we ever were. Our expenses are higher than they've ever been, but we're not the pricing hasn't recovered to where it needs to be to be able to support operations. The pandemic changed that. And so the pandemic, all of a sudden, that shut everything down. All of a sudden, they couldn't afford not to increase their pricing. And so that's right. why we saw the if they had steadily increased from 2015 to 2020, it wouldn't have hurt anybody. You could have predicted right. it, it would have been budgetable, you know, it, it would have been less of a pain than having four to six increases in a in you know a 12 to 18 month period. That's right. where you get your instability. You can't predict out your job costs. That's where people run over budget. That's where people start getting shit rolls downhill. So all of a sudden now, you know, everybody's trying to get the other person to be able to hold that liability. And it's just, right. it's, a, it's a nightmare. It's not the way the business should be practiced. Um, a wealth of knowledge in the drywall industry. Um, this is where I would say that the conversation gets uh, interesting for me because as an entrepreneur, uh, you are diversifying a bit and you are going into, uh, you have a new idea, stop me if I'm wrong, probably not new to you. You've been developing this for a long time, but it's a recycled gypsum concept. And I want to save it for part two. But can you give us a really sweet teaser? Maybe we can talk about how this idea started to germinate in your brain. And, and then uh, we'll kind of leave, we'll leave a nice cliffhanger. 
Yeah, this this developed out of our branching into the commercial side of business. Right. And a hundred percent of and the expansion and growth that was happening in Huntsville. And a hundred percent of the new industry partners that were coming into our market had sustainability goals. And so I was being asked the question, what do we do with our drywall waste? And so that took me down a now eight year rabbit hole. Who's of- having who's having sustainability <laughs> goals? Like they don't this is construction. They don't give a shit about sustainability. Well, so our subs are trying to pay their bills, right? So it's your it's your hierarchy of needs. So, you know, when you're trying to keep your lights on, when you're trying to keep your family fed, you don't have time to think about sustainability, right? No, I'm it's talking your, about I'm talking about the higher ups that it's uh, your key stakeholders. So um it started with me actually a um a project for Boeing. I'll give a shout out to Boeing. So they were one of the early conversations that said we got to get our material out of the landfill um we've got we've got zero waste well, sustainability goals by, pro- at that time it was 2030 right they're probably getting pressure from some other regulatory committee that's like hey you guys waste too much crap is there any way you can like waste less so <laughs> it really goes down to, yeah it goes down to um two things so so one there, there is a genuine concern okay. that new that the new consumer, your younger consumer, has significant concerns about environmental impact from industry. They're learning and it in school. My kids learn it. At school. Yeah. My kids. Are, hey, my, hey, hey, my you guys babies know all the, about it. <laughs> the planet's dying. Hey, dad, the, the cars, cars make emissions like, you know, they're learning about it. Can we yeah, recycle? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so they are looking, these companies are looking 10, 15, 20 years into the future. And so okay. they see that if, if, all of a sudden someone picks up that a CEO is drinking out of a plastic straw, then somebody can put that on social media and people can rally behind it, you know? Yeah. Superficial or not. (laughs) The public Um, can rally behind it. And, and then, you know, all of a sudden Boeing's the devil. (laughs) Yeah. 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 But you took this, you cautious of that. You took these sustainability goals to heart and the question by whatever means was proposed, how can we be more sustainable? And Lana was like, you started to look at the gypsum. Was that you or was that somebody else that that started to sort of observe the waste? Uh, Hey, I'm trying to get my feet in the door of commercial construction. So I'm like, yes, I'll look into it if this is something that people care about. And so because you're smart. um, Well, and and I started looking into it. And what I found is that in my market space, it's roughly one third of every piece of drywall I sell into our community ends up new construction waste. So Uh, one third cut off, thrown into the trash. And so that's how many dollars. Uh, so much waste. It's not just waste of material. It's waste and money, right? Well, a third, what do you sell a sheet for? It, right now, it's like under just under thirty bucks. Yeah, I mean, it's it's high. That's ten bucks a sheet. Yeah, that's ten bucks. You take ten <laughs> bucks so, out of your pocket and throw it in the garbage. You know who could use that ten bucks is the installer, the one that is living paycheck to paycheck, just trying to get by. The one that's getting beat down on their pricing, saying you've got to do more for less. And so, when there's material waste that is going into our landfill, and then there's financial waste that really should be staying in the hands of the contractors, that I mean, that to me was the first red flag. The second red flag was I went to our landfill and said. What are we doing with this? Is it even an issue? Who cares about it? And he said, it's a significant issue. Drywall is toxic in the landfill environment. He said that 
it creates an, an anaerobic condition. It creates hydrogen sulfide, which is one, just a smelly nuisance, but two, it's a toxic condition. It's not something that we should be breathing in our communities. And so we've got to get it out of our landfills. <laughs> and then when I found out that nationwide, out of 25 average billion square feet of drywall produced in the United States annually, 5 billion of that, 20% was becoming new construction waste every single year. And 85% of that was going in the landfill. Only 15% was being recycled. And now I'm being told that it's toxic and it, it actually is very similar to what we were running into with Chinese drywall many years ago. Um, Chinese drywall is being shipped over on barges with not enough oxygen, not enough air coming through. And it has that same anaerobic hot humid condition that you find in a landfill and it starts releasing hydrogen sulfide into the air weird but, i didn't yeah, know that yeah, it doesn't it doesn't belong there <laughs> and so then i so so and what we'll get into on the next half is that I, I i went down this road of trying to figure out well why is only 15 percent being recycled what's the issue with it why are we not doing this who's tried it who's failed what were the barriers to be able to enter this segment and then I went and found the 15% that were recycling it and doing it well and figured out what they were doing. And it was it was kind of a magical journey. It was a whole lot of fun. Totally. So you connected with these ballers that are that are kind of doing this or they're on the forefront of maybe a movement in drywall recycling. Yeah. And, it, you know, we talked about my grandfather and passing away in 2018. The last conversation we had, we had spent two and a half hours talking about updates that um, uh, of the research I was doing on the recycling side. And he was so excited and, you know, he just was so encouraging. And this is something that makes a lot of sense. It's something that we've got to do. And my very last conversation with him, he, he was so excited. He followed me out of the house as I was leaving. And he told me, you just got to do it. He said, it's got to be done. Somebody's got to do it. You might as well be the one to do it. And That's then he told right. me he loved me and then I left and then he passed away. And so it's been um, it's it's really been a passion project that yeah. is not only significant for my business, but significant for my family, significant for my my own mission in life, mission. In I love life. that. So not only did Charlie leave a legacy of Rocket City drywall, but before he went on to the next realm, he planted a little seed like, you know what, you're going to do this. You got to do it. It gives me chills. Seed, it gives me chills. Yeah, that that seed, it carries through the whole story. That seed. So cool. Because it's been a lot of dead ends and a lot of, you know, going down one path and figuring out that's not the right one. And yeah, it's been a it's been a good one. Well, and so to give uh, give our listeners a little background, I was able to have a, a great conversation with Lana on the way up to Canada to hang out with those ballers and have a bunch of fun uh, about this uh, concept. And tell me the name of the recycling company real quick. So it's Back to Earth Gypsum. Back to Earth Gypsum. Uh, we talked about Back to Earth Gypsum and the direction that Alana is going and the parallels between Fresca Harmony and Back to Earth Gypsum and, and these, you know, how they're innovative ideas and they're in entrepreneurial and product development, things like that, which is, you know, I, I noticed a shift in your energy going from the mundane discussion about drywall industry, which is important. And I guarantee there's listeners out there that will find that content uh, interesting to the inspired Alana, when it comes to uh, uh, back to earth, where and and stop me if I'm wrong. Are, has this inspired you to become more aware of the planet, the state we're in, like all of that? So, because that opens up a can of worms. I mean, I, I recycle. I'm conscious of how I'm weird. Like I'm conscious of I don't eat drink water out of water bottles like i will if that's what's around but i carry a water bottle that's one simple thing i don't use plastic bags i carry bags in my truck like and you don't have to pay for bags in albuquerque like you do in california wherever i just do that because plastic bags like blow around the sea and like they're wasteful so i try in my day-to-day -day life i try not to be wasteful there's a lot of things that we can do on a personal level to be more conscious 
of our environment. It, have you, and I'll, we'll, this will sort of be the tail end, have you, because of this, has it inspired you to become more conscious about other faucets running your business, your personal life? It, it has. Probably the biggest thing it did was it highlighted how big some of these issues are mm -hmm. and how out of control some of these issues are. Yeah. And so it really helped me focus back in on control the controllables. So yes. I can't solve all, I, as much as my grandfather and I tried, I can't solve all the problems in the world. Right. Um, but I can influence the small everyday decisions that we make. Yep. And I have a company and, and my company is small, but it's not, it, it's not insignificant. It is, no. it is certainly pretty, we put on average about 15 million square feet of drywall into our market space every year. That's and cool. so that means that one third of that is going into my landfill. And if I can have influence or control or accountability for the products that I'm putting out into the market space, then that's where my energy has to go to. And that um, is, is probably the bigger the bigger deal for us. But yes, no, pro I, we're gardening now. I only ever cool. killed plants. Now <laughs> I've got this nice, you know, cool relationship with, with gardening. And that's yeah. been a, that's been a, a shift. Um, I also, we don't use plastic bottles, so we, we carry around our own bottles. We um, are yeah. certainly looking at, you know, you don't have to completely turn over your life to a completely different no. life. You don't have to, there's little incremental things that you can do every day yeah. that can, that can provide a, a little shift, a little influence. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, th it makes me think of the expression, think globally, act locally. Sometimes the, the troubles of the world are so loud and you watch social media and it's all about the, it's all about the chaos. It's all about the turmoil. And uh, I shut off the news a long time ago, 10 years ago. I don't watch it. It's probably, you know, and, and people do, and there's nothing against that. My family does. That's fine. If it's important, it'll show up on social media or my friends will tell me or what, you know, I'll get the news. Um, that said, I try to focus on that sphere aspect of the impact that I'm creating in the sphere that I'm in, a podcast, coaching soccer, uh, being conscious of what I'm using and my impact on the planet every day. Like, I don't care how green you are. That's important to be conscious of the waste that we're continually creating. Um, so the excitement of the next segment, <laughs> part two, Alana, Rocket City Drywall, and the concept of back to earth. And for all you gardeners out there, uh, it may be a product that will help out your garden uh, this, uh, this coming summer. <laughs> help those flowers grow a little bit but we will have a part two uh we'll get in touch online with that and we will save your pearl of wisdom for the end of the second episode uh final thoughts not my pearl of wisdom though <laughs> no we're gonna save it we're gonna that's gonna be that's gonna you don't get the pearl of wisdom unless you listen to part two back to earth the product that's gonna revolutionize the drywall drywall industry my final thoughts are thank you for what you're doing here. I, I, I've said it before. I really think that it is significant what you're doing with the podcast. It gives thank you. That it gives voice, it gives community, it gives advocacy, and that is really significant. And I think you're doing an incredible job. Thank you so much. And I appreciate that. If you, if they do want to, if they're inclined to, they love the industry report from Alana. It's kick-ass. She's totally knowledgeable, and this is why she runs Rocket City Drywall. If they want to follow Alana on your social media platforms, we've got Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, oh, Adventures in Baby Boom, which uh, I'll have to start. Baby Boom. <laughs> yeah, have... no, so you'll find, you'll find us on um, – we do have – we are a little active on Instagram as well, so with Rocket oh, yeah. City Drywall. Okay. Just 
Uh, personally, you can find me. Um, my I have kind of a split personality, so um, or split identity. So you'll find me as Alana Black on any of the okay. personal sites. So that's uh, Facebook and Instagram. On LinkedIn, I'm still Alana Parker. That was my uh, name okay. before I got married. That's kind of what I built. That's who everybody in the industry knows me as is Alana Parker. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your time today. We will do this again, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Huge shout out to Alana for being with us on the Drywall Podcast today. Tune in next Friday as we dive into part two the story of Back to Earth and how she created an amazing product that might be changing the drywall industry. Also, a couple accolades that may be worth mentioning. YP of the Year, Chamber of Commerce 2016. Alana was also Female Entrepreneur of the Year, Women's Business Center 2018. Alabama Small Business Person of the Year, Washington, D.C., 2019, and much more. If you would like links to these accolades, you can contact me directly at info at frescoharmony.com. Thank you so much for joining us on the Drywall Podcast today. Day. I really, really, really appreciate you guys listening. The Drywall Podcast continues to grow in this space, and it's all because of listenership like you. I really appreciate it. I hope you all have an amazing weekend, and remember, keep drywalling. <laughs>